I got in plenty of trouble when I was a kid, and most of it was justified, um, things that I had done. But there was an occasion, uh, a rare occasion, where there were times when I got in trouble for something that I didn't do. And nothing was more frustrating to me than to be blamed for something that I didn't do. Um, I think in terms of interpersonal communication, emotion is the the, the aspect of communication that gets blamed for so much and is not really responsible for those things, mostly because we misunderstand emotion and how it works. So I want to take a moment here to look at, at how we can understand emotion more effectively. What is it? How does it work? How does it operate? What's the nature of emotion? And, uh, and uh, why does it sometimes get the blame for some things that it's not really responsible for? But so starting with this video, we're going to take a look at starting with the definition of emotion. What is an emotion? Emotion is the body's multidimensional response to any event that either enhances or inhibits your goals. So there's a lot there to unpack. We're going to take a, take this apart piece by piece and look at the fact that it's multidimensional, um, that it's that in response to an event that it enhances or inhibits your goals. We're going to look at all those things um, as we define emotion and as we seek to understand emotion more fully. Okay? But first of all, uh, let's take a look at emotion versus mood. Sometimes these are terms that get thrown around interchangeably like they're the same thing, but they're not the same thing. There are two primary differences between emotion and mood. Um, the first is the source. Um, emotion, as we just talked about in that definition, has a source. It's a response to an event, to something specific. There's something um, specific and identifiable that triggers an emotion. Mood, not so much. Moods just kind of fall on us. They do just kind of come out of this kind. It could be just as simple as waking up on the wrong side of the bed. Who knows where moods come from at this point? We don't really understand, but but we know where emotions come from. Emotions are triggered by a specific event and come from a source. Mood does not. The other big difference is duration. We know that emotions tend not to last as long as as moods do. Moods tend to linger. at like that cartoon where you see the, the rain cloud following people around, right? A mood tends to do that. It tends a good mood or a bad mood tends to linger longer, tends to hang out with you longer. An emotion will come and go faster. It will fade away a little faster. Again, good or bad doesn't matter. Emotion, the duration of emotion tends to be less than that of a mood. So there are differences here, specifically that for emotion that we know where they come from and they don't last quite as long, whereas moods, we don't really understand the source and they tend to last longer. So our discussion, though, is going to focus on emotion. So let's talk a little bit about the nature of emotion, some different characteristics of, of emotion that are important. First, uh, emotions are multidimensional. We experience emotions in um, several different ways. So first, we experience emotions uh, through physiological changes. Right. Have you ever noticed when you experience a strong emotion, your body temperature may go up. You may start to sweat more, right? You may you may notice some sweating. Again, could be good emotion, could be a bad, what we consider a good or bad emotion, a positive or negative emotion. Doesn't matter. When we experience a strong emotion, we will start to sweat some. Our body temperature will go up. Our stomach may tighten up. You know, things like that. Um, we may experience some of those different physiological changes, meaning meaning changes to our body that we experience in our body with us with the uh, the emotion. We also have nonverbal reactions that are a part of emotion, that are a part of experiencing that emotion and part of expressing that emotion, um, these nonverbal reactions that go along with them as another dimension of emotion. So we have changes that happen within our body and these physiological changes that, that come along with, with emotion, but we also have these nonverbal reactions. We express a lot of our emotion through these nonverbal reactions, through our facial expressions, through our gesturing, through our posture, all these different types of things that we use to, to express and experience emotion using those nonverbal reactions. Those two are two that people usually are like, yeah, I get that. I've seen that. I mean, I understand how those work. I'm having experienced an emotion. I can see those. The other two dimensions are some that we may not think about quite as much or quite as directly as associated with emotion. So the first of those is cognitive interpretations. We have a way to uh, of of translating sort of emotion. How how are we going to experience this emotion, um, and and how are we going to express that emotion is largely based on our cognitive interpretation, right? When we experience an emotion, is it something that we enjoy? You know, why do some people enjoy horror movies? They enjoy being scared. Why is that? Other people are like, no, thank you. I don't want to be scared. 
Um, so our cognitive interpretation of, um, in terms of experiencing that emotion tells us, you know, that's a positive thing. I want that. I like that. I need that. Or no, I don't like that. Or just even experiencing, you know, we talked about physiological changes and nonverbal reactions. Those can be a little ambiguous, right? So if I said you're experiencing a strong emotion, and as a result, you are, your body temperature is going up, you're starting to sweat a little bit, um, you, you notice that your face is feeling a little flush, and, and your stomach is tightened up, um, you, you, you're getting, your hands are a little clammy, those types of things. So what emotion are you experiencing? If you notice that you've had those physiological changes, what emotion are you experiencing then? Well, based on that, it could be that you're super angry. It could be that you're in love. It could be that you're, you know, experiencing anything in between there, right? Because these physiological changes tend to be kind of similar for a lot of different emotions, right? So how do we know what emotion we're feeling? Well, our cognitive interpretations tell us, well, I'm in this, I'm in this situation. This is the context. This is what's happening. And so as a result, it's most likely this emotion. And then how do I feel about that? How, how strongly do I feel about it? And, we, and then we, are we spiraling out here? Are we talking to ourselves, telling ourselves this is a big deal or no, it's not a big deal and so forth. You know, cognitive interpretation is a very strong impact on our emotion, the way that we experience it, the intensity with which we experience it, the way that we're going to express that emotion. So our cognitive interpretations go a long way in helping us identify and express those emotions. Then finally, our verbal expression is, is part of our emotional uh, expression too. It, um, it's part of that is one of those dimensions, the way that we express our emotions verbally, you know, not only uh, what words we choose in, in a verbal sense, like what, what language do we use to express our emotions, which we'll talk about in another video as well, how important that is, but what language do we use to uh, express that emotion, to, to kind of explain that emotion and so forth. And then also along with that, the, the paralanguage that goes with that, how we express, you know, not only what words do we choose, but how loudly do we exclaim it and, and what tone and so forth that goes along with that verbal expression. That's another aspect of, of emotion, of, of experiencing and expressing that emotion. So you can see emotions are multidimensional in the fact that they, that they really go through all four of these dimensions that we experience them, not just as something that, you know, jumps in our gut and gives us butterflies or whatever, but the, we have those physiological changes, but it also involves nonverbal reactions, cognitive interpretations, and verbal expression. You put all that in the blender and you have what, what it is to experience that emotion and then ultimately express that emotion. So first we need to understand that emotions are multidimensional. We also need to understand that emotions vary in valence. And valence is basically a, a fancy word to say positive or negative is an emotion good or bad for us? Is, is this a good emotion or a bad emotion? And, and that can be a little tricky too, because, uh, you know, it really just depends on the, on these two factors. So first it depends on the intensity of that emotion. To what degree are we experiencing that emotion? And, and is it an appropriate level for that context? Right. If it's something that's really, really serious, then experiencing an emotion very, very strongly would be appropriate, would be expected in that situation. But if it's something that's more minor and insignificant, and yet you're having this major blowout, then that's, you know, maybe not an appropriate level of intensity. Sometimes I think about too, when I played, uh, played football in my much, much younger days, I was a football player and we would sometimes, you know, work ourselves up before a game talking about how, you know, the other team, they didn't like us. They were saying bad things about us. They were talking about our girlfriends or our moms or whatever. And we, and so we would use this to, to develop some, these, you know, almost anger to kind of, to kind of hype us up a little bit. So we play harder and, and push harder during the game. And that's, that's fine. Except when, if it got overboard and we got so angry that then we were trying to, you know, intentionally hurt somebody, then that intensity is out of that range, out of that appropriate range, right? So we need to watch the intensity with which we experience an emotion and make sure that, that uh, we're experiencing it with the appropriate level of intensity. Also need to think about duration. How long is that emotion staying with us? Again, emotions don't tend to last as long as moods, but is it, you know, are we experiencing that emotion for an appropriate period of time? If it's something small, again, it should be a shorter duration. If it's something major, maybe we hold on to it longer. Um, and it all just depends on context and what's happening. Again, in the example of that football game, that those emotions should not last after the final whistle of that game. Right after the final whistle, we need to, to let go of those emotions. But if we hang on to it and then we start, you know, we're, we hang on to that anger and we're getting into fights in the parking lot after the game and so forth. 
that's a problem. That's that's an inappropriate duration. So again, we need to really think about what's the appropriate range for this emotion in terms of intensity and duration and look at those things and, and say, OK, are we experiencing this for an appropriate period of time and at the appropriate in level of intensity? And that's going to vary for every emotion. And then based on that, if it's within that appropriate range, then we can say that that emotion has a positive valence. And if it's outside of that, then it could have a negative valence. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter what that emotion is. If it's anger, some people say, well, anger is a bad emotion, right? It's a, it obviously is a negative valence. Well, not necessarily. Anger could be positive. As I said, it could get you hyped up for a football game. It could, you know, do, do some good things for you. I'm not saying everybody should be angry all the time, but at the appropriate intensity and duration in that context, it may be an emotion with a positive valence, again, helping us achieve our goals. Emotions are, are, are essentially, essentially measured in the sense of, do they help me achieve a goal or are they keeping me, are they inhibiting me from reaching that goal? And if that emotion is, is helping me achieve that goal, then it's a positive one. It's a positive valence. And people would probably say, you know, well, love is obviously a positive valence, right? Love. And yeah, for the most part, it is. Most of the time it is. But what if that love turns into like infatuation or we hang on to it too long after a relationship is over, it's ended. We're no longer in that relationship. And yet we can't let go of that other person to move on with our lives. Then some people would say, well, that's that's gotten a, a duration or intensity that's that's out of whack for that context and, and maybe has a negative valence and keeping us from doing other things, keeping us from achieving those goals. Right. So we need to look at every emotion in terms of uh, is this an appropriate emotion, first of all, for that context? And then am I experiencing it in the appropriate intensity and duration to measure for a positive valence? Or is this outside of that range? and therefore a negative valence. Emotions also finally come in primary and secondary forms. If you remember, you know, when you're in elementary school, you had a color wheel, right? Probably. And you had those primary colors of is it red and yellow and blue, I think are the primary colors. And then the other colors are really made up out of combinations from there and combinations of those combinations, right? And so forth. So you mix yellow and blue, you get green, you mix yellow and red, you get orange, right? And so forth. And so the same thing is kind of true for emotion. You could almost do like a color wheel of emotion where you have these primary emotions like joy and acceptance and fear and so forth. When you combine those, right, when you combine fear and acceptance, you get submission, you get the emotion of submission. When you combine anticipation and joy, you get optimism and so forth, right? So emotion can come in these primary forms, but it also then is combined to make these secondary emotions. It's not to say the secondary emotions are less valid or less, less intense or that they, you know, the experience of those is, is diminished in any way. It's just a matter of understanding how emotion is constructed and that some of these are, are combinations of different, you know, uh, uh different uh, combinations of emotion and that to, to construct different things. Right? So, so hopefully now we have a better understanding of the foundational elements of emotion so that we can get to the idea of, okay, there's some things we can control here. There's some, there's some, it's not just something that happens to us. Emotion, emotion gets blamed for a lot of things. We say, well, I can't help it. It was just emotion. I was emotional, right? That's not really good enough at this point. We can control a lot of this and we should control a lot of this as best we can. So um, hopefully we have a better understanding of emotion to build from as we look at some other aspects of emotion as well. If you have questions about emotion or how it impacts or relates to interpersonal communication, please feel free to email me. I'd, I'd love to, to speak with you on that account. In the meantime, again, consider these foundational aspects and definitely dig into these other videos that we're going to have on emotion so that we can continue to not only um, see those emotions happen, but we can continue to understand them better, identify them more easily and manage them more productively than we have in the past.